chapter number 12. Verse 12, John 12, 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, the next day after the dinner in Bethany, after the Sabbath, this would be the first day of the week, the next day, the first day of the week. This is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Now, you go figure. I'm going to title this Palm Sunday, A Clear Choice. You can figure out where I got that clear choice if you watch a whole bunch of commercials there, you know. A clear choice. I said, there's got to be something more than teeth to this. Amen. So uh, we got a clear choice right here concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Palm Sunday. On the next day, the first day, Sunday, after the supper at Bethany, the resurrection day, first day of the week, and of course next Lord's Day is the first day being uh, resurrection day or called once in the Bible Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday. Now the Bible said on the next day much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, the king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him, and the people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus, Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for they heard that, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. Now, what we're, what we're looking at right here in uh, John chapter number 12 is the Lord Jesus commencing the final phase of his earthly life. Up to this point, Jesus avoided the desires of the people to make him king. And because of time, I'm not going to go back in the gospel and the synoptics as well as the book of John and, and, and uh, show you uh, that Jesus avoided people trying to make him king. It wasn't his time. Now, this I do know, that sometimes the hand of God is doing most when we are least conscious of the fact. Sometimes he works hardest when we think he is doing nothing. If you'll notice in Zechariah, just listen to this verse. He's quoting uh, Matthew 21, uh, Luke uh, chapter number 19, Mark chapter 11, John chapter number 12. is quoting Zechariah chapter number 9 and verse number 9 when the Bible says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now, I can understand John chapter number 11 making headlines, couldn't you? If I got in here and I said, Jesus Christ just raised a man from the dead, and, uh, it, it, and, and we opened the, what, what does Milton produce, the Gazette? I don't know, Milton Journal, Milton Gazette, whatever they produce there. Who? Oh, Press Gazette, Milton Press Gazette. We get the Press Gazette. Front page, Lazarus raised from the dead. The Lord Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Front page. But now we get to John chapter number 12. We got this little obscure passage. We may find this somewhere in the back of the paper in a little bitty column, a little bitty place, that Jesus is riding to Jerusalem on a donkey. You see, we can understand why some things make headlines, but riding on the donkey... Did you know, though, that it fulfills a whole lot of things? It's really doing more than we think it is. If you'll go back to Daniel chapter number 9, I'm going to show you something. Daniel chapter number 9. Daniel chapter number 9. This riding, this riding the donkey presenting himself as king of kings and lord of lords in John chapter number 12 actually closes the 69th week of Daniel. It does. Are y'all familiar with the 70 weeks of Daniel? If you're not, read them in Daniel chapter 9. That's not what the sermon is about today. But if you'll notice in Daniel chapter number 9, 
and verse number 25. Know therefore, and by the way, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon Israel, in verse 24. But verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks, you got seven weeks and threescore and two, you got 62 weeks and you got seven weeks, that equals 69 weeks, am I right? That's not, we don't use common core at the Faith Baptist Church. We like it to be exact. You know, that's just, to me, that's just another attempt at trying to get people off of the truth and, and get them to exact numbers. Is this common core thing. And you say, why'd you put that in your sermon? Because I can. I can do that. Amen. Uh, 62 plus 9 uh, is, uh, 62 plus uh, 7 is 69. 62 plus 7 is 69. It's not 70. At the end of 69 weeks, the Bible said Messiah was going to be cut off. All right, there had to be a point in time where the 69th week ended because the Bible said after that 69th week, two things were going to happen. Messiah would be cut off for the sins of the people, not himself, and that the city would be destroyed. And we know that Titus, the Roman general, came in in A.D. 70 and destroyed Jerusalem. All right, what ended the 69th week? The triumphant entry. John chapter 12, the triumphant entry, ended that 69 week. And three days later, after the triumphant entry, the Lord Jesus Christ was cut off. Three days later, on Wednesday. Did you know that this Good Friday thing just doesn't add up? There's some more common core. That's some more common core. Good Friday, Jesus crucified on Friday and raised on Sunday just don't add up. It's three days and three nights in the grave. That just doesn't add up. So if the day begins at 6 o'clock, Jesus had to be crucified on Wednesday, put in the grave before 6 o'clock. The first, that Thursday after the Passover was a special Sabbath, so Thursday was a Sabbath. I have no problem with this. I hope you don't. We're going to talk about it more next week. Thursday was a Sabbath. Then you have your regular Saturday Sabbath. Uh, and then you have the first day of the week. And the, Lord, and the women came to the tomb pre-dawn, and there was no body. Jesus had stayed in the grave three days and three nights. Three full 24-hour days. Jesus stayed in the grave. All right, so this 69th week is ended. Now, not only, we're talking about um, um, uh, the Lord's hand doing the most when we are least conscious of the fact. Sometimes the Lord works hardest when we think that He is doing nothing. But the Lord was able to ride on an unbroken colt. And that supplies food for thought. Any other rider would have been thrown to the ground. And if you think about it, here the donkey shows more sense than most humans because he's recognizing the Lord of creation. And uh, we know the Bible is God. We know that the Bible says in the book of John as well, in John chapter number 20 and verse number 30 and 31, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So the Bible makes it very clear that the Gospel of John was written so you could believe Christ. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Believing he is the Christ and the Son of God, who does that, who does that present him as? The Christ being the Old Testament Messiah being the Son of God, being divinity. John chapter number 1, verse number 1, starts off with who Christ is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word, verse 14, was made flesh. God was made flesh and dwelled among us. It's imperative you know who the Lord Jesus Christ is. How in the world can you trust Him unless you know who He is? or know, You have to know something about Him. You just don't decide one day you're going to come to church and get saved, my dear friend. You're going to get saved after looking at the Word of God. As John chapter number 4 said, Jesus said, If you knew the gift of God and who it was, you would have asked and I would have given you the water of life freely. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said, You're going to know a couple of things, who I am, what the gift of God is. How in the world can you trust somebody? If you believe in God, believe also in me. John chapter number 14. Uh, the rich young ruler, Jesus said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good. 
Jesus was asking the rich young ruler, are you accepting me as who you say I am? Good. Are you accepting me as God the Son? God in the flesh. So you're going to know who Christ Jesus is. Amen? Now, uh, again, we look at Jesus riding the donkey, showed that he had... He was Lord of creation. He created everything according to Colossians chapter number 1 that repeats Genesis chapter number 1. He created everything and by Him there was nothing made that was made. Amen. Jesus Christ is a creator. He is God. He is God the Son. He is God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You want to know, you want to know about the Father? You want to know the character of the Father? You want to know the kindness of the Father? Then look at the Son you can find the character of the Father. Why? Because He is God embodied. Amen. He's God incarnate. Jesus is God. He was made lower than the angels and He spoke. God spoke through His Son, Hebrews chapter number 1 in these last days. So Jesus Christ is God. Now, here's an opportunity for you to recognize Him. Jesus was fulfilling Scripture. He was fulfilling Zechariah chapter number 9 and verse number 9. Now, you can read the accounts in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John concerning a triumphant entry, and I realize that a couple of words are left out uh, of the gospel writer's message that was included in Zechariah chapter number 9, verse number 9. Well, if you'll read that and study that, and I'm not going to dwell upon it right now, but if you'll read that and study that, there's, he's coming back again. He's coming back again. And, and uh, then, of course, the fountain will be open to the house of David, uh, is what the Bible says uh, there in that day in Revelation chapter number 19. But anyway, uh, in um, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, he's Lord of creation, recognizing who he is, who he is, and of course what he did to satisfy the demands of a holy God. A person believes that God will impute the righteousness of his son to you, and therefore we're born into God's family and we have no problem. We have no worry from that point on as far as going to heaven. I like what Brother Paul brought out in Sunday school this morning. Salvation is sure. It is a no-so salvation. But you better make sure, my dear friend, what you know is right. According to Ephesians chapter number 1, verse number 13. All right, uh, let's go back to Exodus chapter number 12. Exodus chapter 12. Follow along with me, if you will. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter number 12 and verse number 3. Have your Bibles. Turn with me. I'm trying to go slow enough in the Scripture for you to follow along. Recognizing the Lord, a clear choice on Palm Sunday. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. In other words, choose your Passover lamb. Choose your lamb. Again, Jesus Christ is giving the nation of Israel right here a clear choice. I am the king of kings. I am fulfilling Zechariah chapter number 9, verse number 9. I am offering you peace. I'm offering you a kingdom. John chapter number 14, verse number 6. We're to choose our lamb. Jesus Christ was making the choice very clear for Israel. And then in John chapter number 14, verse number 6, I think you know that verse. He said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Go back in our text in John chapter 12, look at verse 46. John chapter 12 and look at verse 46. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. I'm giving you a clear choice right here in John chapter number 12. Um, a clear choice. John chapter number 1 and verse number 9. John chapter 1 and verse number 9. Turn over there if you will. I use this verse quite often. John chapter 1 and verse number 9. Jesus Christ, the Bible said in verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Based on that verse right there and other places in Scripture, Jesus Christ has lighted every man that comes into the world. 
And when we receive that light, act upon that light, you know what God will do? God will give us more light. God will give us more light. Take your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21 records Palm Sunday, uh, the Lord coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. And it goes on in the latter part of that chapter, beginning in verse number 23. And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it, from heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, You ought to look at this, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. It's not because Jesus wouldn't, didn't want to tell them. It's because they didn't receive the first truth that God gave them concerning John the Baptist. He sent John the Baptist preparing the way. They rejected John the Baptist. Jesus didn't give them any more truth. It's not that he didn't want to. Right just prior to this, he was riding a donkey into Jerusalem. And for the, the, those that claim to be scholars, the good citizens of, citizens of Jerusalem, they could have put two and two together. Here is our king offering himself again a very clear choice. But they refused the Lord Jesus Christ. Now back to John chapter number 1, verse number 9. The Bible said that he lighteth every man that comes into the world. And by reading that verse, you and I, as believers, you and I reading the Bible would have to reject, reject any, any point of Calvinistic doctrine that says that limited atonement or irresistible or irresistible grace. Every five points of that tulip you and I could, could dismantle with the Word of God. Every last, every last one of them. So man is not, as the Calvinists preach, totally depraved. Man is totally lost. Totally lost. But the Bible says that every man has light in John chapter number 1, verse number 9. That image is not eradicated. That image is marred by sin, Genesis chapter 3. Now, I'm going to show you something. That's not just David Rowan. Go to Romans chapter 1. If you'll follow along with me, we'll learn something today. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Jesus lighted every man that comes into the world. We say we believe salvation is a choice. If we really believe that, then man has the opportunity to make a choice. Man has a free will. Man has that free. Why? Because he has light. He has light to act upon. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 18 and 19, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God, you read the rest for yourself, is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are what? So the fellow down in South America on the Amazon is without excuse. It's never heard a clear presentation of the gospel that you folks have the opportunity to hear every Sunday. Is that man without excuse? That's what it says. That's what it says. I like that. That's your authority. But men, men want to set their own standards and their own rules and live by their own standard of righteousness, so they change Romans 1. Romans 1 is still Romans 1. The Bible said... Um, 
They hold the truth in unrighteousness. In verse 18, and when a man keeps on rejecting and rejecting, you know what he does in verse 25? He changes the truth. He writes his own book, writes his own Bible, gets his own standards. I bear them record they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they're going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And Jesus Christ, verse 4 of Romans 10, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Romans 2, while you're in Romans. God lighteth every man that comes into the world. Romans 2. Verse 14. This is going to be hard to refute now, folks. It is. Light. We have light by creation. It's manifest within us. That, 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 that uh, image was not eradicated. That image was marred in Genesis 3. The first Adam messed it up. 1 Corinthians 15, the second Adam, the last Adam, fixed it up. Amen? And uh, you know this to be true. If we'll look at the Bible, the Bible will do two things. It'll either mess you up or fix you up. You know, why will the Bible mess you up? Because it goes against a whole lot of tradition. Who was it in this conference? Was it Brother Dewey? Was it you that said, who gives tradition? Tradition doesn't come from our worst enemy. Where does tradition come from? Those that we love the most. From our fathers. But there's a time that men begin to put tradition over the rudiments and commandments of God, and then what happens there? It becomes... They, they've, left, they've left the whole blueprint. They've established their own what? Righteousness. Their own standard of righteousness. There, there is no gray area in the Bible. It's either black or white. And this, if this, is, if this is our authority. So anywhere we go, it, it gets us out of the fight if we'll say, well, this is what he says. What? No, you, I said, this is what he says. This is what he says over here in Romans chapter number 2 and verse number 14. He says, For when the Gentiles which have not the law, who did God give the law to on Mount Sinai? The Jews. The Gentiles which have not the law. Oh, look at this. We do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, or a law unto themselves. Now, how in the world can I do the things contained in the law, and I've never heard the law? How can, verse 15, let's read it, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Why, before you ever heard the law or had a clear understanding of who Jesus is and what the Bible is and what it means, as a child, why did you know it was wrong to lie? Your conscience. Now, your conscience is not your guide. Don't use the conscience as standards. Because you know what happens when we break that conscience and we defile that conscience over the years? It's seared. And so a conscience is not a good guide, but you know what the conscience will do? It'll apply the standards. It'll apply... What's our standard? The Word of God. The light. The Word of God. The Word of God. All right, so we have a conscience. And the conscience would accuse us or excuse us. So that it just, it, this just keeps proving that John chapter number 1, verse number 9 is true. That Jesus lighted every man that comes into the world. We have creation. We have conscience manifest in us. And then chapter 3. What advantage, chapter 3, verse 1, what advantage then hath the Jews or what profit is there of circumcision in much every way chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Did you know what we have in front of us today? The oracles of God. We have, we have a more sure word of prophecy. We have light. We have light. Amen. <laughs> Amen, brother. All right, back... Um, all right, so we, we, we have our path. We had to choose our Passover lamb. Jesus is offering himself. Now, it's interesting, and I'm, I'm looking at the time, and I know I have to baptize today, but a clear choice, if we look at Zechariah chapter number 9, verse number 9, 
And we note John chapter 12 and verse number 13. Um, the Bible says, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna. Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save now, or, or joy and rejoicing. Um, but now, let me look at that verse. Go back, to, go back to Luke. Luke 19. Luke 19. I might have to uh, wrap it up and look at a little bit more of it tonight. But look at Luke 19, verse number 38. Saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. And then Luke, Luke, it's one thing about reading all of the Gospels. You can, you can take what everyone says and have you a real pretty picture. Some will insert things that others don't say. And Brother Paul brought out specifically this morning that each gospel writer had an intent by the Holy Spirit of what to portray or what to relay as far as the message. Matthew being to the Jews, presenting Christ as king. Well, John had, and we call the first three gospels the synoptic. That means that they pretty well repeat each other. Pretty well everything's in order about the happenings and everything. But John's not a synoptic gospel. John was written for the purpose of what? That... that that you might be showing that Christ is God, that you might believe, and by believing, you could have what? Life through His name. All right, now, so Luke says, in verse 19, chapter 19, verse number 38, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So that was, that was something that John didn't say. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Last time I remember something like that was in Luke chapter 2, to the shepherds. Wasn't it? Amen. All right, that's good, isn't it? All right, now let's... Um, uh, and, then, and then, of course, uh, Ephesians 2, I believe it's Ephesians 2.14, uh, He is our peace that broke down the middle wall of partition. He, he, he took it out of the way. He took all the ordinances of handwriting that was against us, took them out of the way, nailing it to His cross. And so we have access to a holy God because of peace. You see, peace is not made when you come down and ask God to do it. Peace was made at Calvary. How was peace made? Colossians 1.20. By the blood of who? His cross. When was his blood shed? At Cal it's not going to be shed again. Peace was made. Reconciliation was made at Calvary. So he is peace. All right, now, but there's coming, according to Zechariah, there's coming a peace to, you know, Israel has rejected Christ. But God said he was going to take, and he's grafted us in the olive tree, which he's a, he wrote the book on horticulture. He can graft you in so you'll never, you, no one could ever see that you weren't originally born in that tree or, or, or part of that tree. Did you know what, if God said, if I can graft a wild branch into a olive tree, how much better could I graft the original branch back into the olive tree? You know when that's going to happen? Revelation 19. Amen? Uh, all right. That's when he's going to do it. Um, Matthew 21, 9. Matthew 21, 9. A clear choice. Palm, this is Palm Sunday. Jesus come riding in Jerusalem, offering himself as Israel's Messiah. Clear choice. Clear choice. They rejected him. Uh, no one could argue that it was in a clear choice. Look at Matthew chapter 21 and verse number 9. The Bible said, And the multitudes that went before and followed crying, saying, Hosanna. Now we've got something added here that we didn't see in Luke and John. Hosanna to who? Do you think that, do you think that these, this crowd, these citizens of... Uh, Jerusalem recognized Jesus for being the son of David. And, and recognizing Christ to be the son of David would recognize his rightful choice or his rightful declaration to sit on the throne of David and be king of Israel. I, I just, just thought I'd bring that out. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest. I've read everything except Mark, haven't I? Mark 11. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verse number 9 and 10. This is Palm Sunday. This is when the Lord rode the donkey into Jerusalem. The Bible says in verse 9 of Mark 11, and they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Verse 10, blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. They realized the scripture that Messiah was going to set up a kingdom. It was a clear choice. Jesus Christ fulfilled Zechariah. It's a clear choice. People could, have, people could have accepted Christ, but most rejected him. And I'm not going to compare the entry, but I will maybe tonight. The entry into Jerusalem as compared to his final entry into Jerusalem, and I'll do that, I'll do that tonight. It was going to be this morning, uh, but here's what I am going to say. Um, the good citizens of, uh, of Jerusalem, these that cried Hosanna, these that said, here comes the son of David, here is the king. This, this same crowd changed their mind, didn't present him a kingdom, why they believed in vain, like Brother Paul was saying. They presented him a crown of thorns. They turned him over to Pilate, and they said, his blood be upon us. And, our, and you know, did you know that was fulfilled? It was. The blood was upon them and their children. They rejected him. Did you know that the future citizens of Jerusalem, according to Zechariah, and I'll, I'll look at this tonight, according to Zechariah chapter number 13, verse number 1, the future citizens of Jerusalem will accept the fountain open to the house of David. But they'll do that in Revelation 19. But a lot of people now, a lot of people did accept Christ. Look at, um, here's a conclusion of the whole matter. Look at John 12, 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, what did he say he would do? He would draw all men unto me. If I be lifted up from the earth. Brother, sir, all men. What does it say? The frozen chosen? All men. All men. The Lord's not long suffering to us, Lord. Or, uh, the Lord is not slack to. to. Mm. Second Peter 3 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But his long suffering to us were not willing that any, I like that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Um, when the Lord Jesus, and when we lift him up here, a lot of people use that verse, and, and you could make an application if we lift him up in the service today and exalt him and talk about him and praise him. Um, if we make much of Christ, and that's, that's a good statement. And that is, that's true. If we make much of Christ, people are going to find him. But Jesus in John chapter number 12 is talking about being lifted up where? Calvary. Lifted up between heaven and earth on the cross of Calvary. And there he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. There, there the justice of God was satisfied. The wrath of God was appeased. Everything necessary for redemption was, was accomplished. Not halfway accomplished, was accomplished. It's finished at Calvary. God, the Bible said in Isaiah 53, verse 11, God saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. God is completely satisfied with the work of Christ. Now, we're to preach the ministry. We're to preach reconciliation. We're to preach what we preached this morning. And if we keep preaching this, then, then that darkened mind is going to be enlightened. Those that are seeking are going to grab hold of it. And they're going to realize that it's nothing that they have ever done it's all, salvation is all what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. The, 
the Lord attracts or draws people through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, what he did on Calvary. And you know what he does? He empowers believers to proclaim it. Now, there's your privilege. There's your privilege, missionaries. Your privilege is being included. God, God includes us. And God, through his word, said that he was going to always include us to propagate his message. Isn't that wonderful? And uh, anyway, the Holy Spirit sealed the believers. And the Bible said in verse 19 that the world is gone after him. In, um, in the book of Acts, it said that these men have turned the world upside down. But the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 1, 21, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them to believe. You know what God's doing? We talk about how the world's turned upside down, but God commissions us and proceeds to set the world right side up. That's what we're to be doing, is giving forth the gospel, seeing man get saved. All right, God bless you. I'm, I'm through. I'm, I'm through. Let's uh, stand to our feet. The ones that are candidates for baptism, please go up into the rooms and get ready. Um, I'm going to ask you if you... Um, if you, we're going to play just a stanza of an invitation. If you need to come for any reason at all, you need some questions answered, you need someone to help you at this altar, that's what we're here for. We'll take the Bible and we'll, we'll open it up and show you how that you can go to heaven.